Hello, it's Sue Anstis here. And just before you listen to this episode of The Game Changers, I wanted to quickly tell you that my new documentary, Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport, is now available to watch on Netflix in the UK. It's a powerful film that explores the recent growth in women's sport and its impact across society. It will open your eyes to the challenges faced by female athletes and bring hope for a future where women and girls have equal access and opportunity in sport. I really hope you enjoy it. Now it's time for the Game Changers. Hello and welcome to The Game Changers, the podcast where you'll hear from extraordinary trailblazing women in sport. I'm your host, Sue Anstis, and I am thrilled to welcome you to this special bonus episode of The Game Changers, where I talk to world champion heptathlete, Katerina Johnson-Thompson. Before I introduce you to this global sporting superstar, I'd like to thank Barclays for their ongoing support of The Game Changers podcast. There are a few brands across the world who are doing more for women's sport right now. Barclays are the title sponsor of the Women's Super League, and they also back the FA in the fantastic work it does to ensure that every schoolgirl across the country will have a chance to play football by 2024. My guest today played a bit of football herself growing up, but soon turned her attentions to track and field, where she's had incredible success. Having almost quit athletics after disappointment at the Rio Olympics in 2016, Kat changed much in her life to go on to become world champion in 2019, breaking the British record in the process. It's wonderful to hear how Kat is now fully focused on the Games in Japan later this month. She's also taking time to support the great work of Liverpool Football Club Foundation and Nike as they launch Game On, a campaign that's helping youngsters from marginalised communities access more sporting and coaching opportunities. I began by asking Kat to take us back to that night in Doha in 2019 when she became world champion. How did she feel going into the final event? Yeah, going into the final event, it's always a bit of, you have to weigh up as a heptathlete. You know, you know the scenarios at that point. That's the time you can get competitive. That's the time, you know, like how many seconds you need to beat this person by how big a gap you need to be and then you've got your race plans in order to get that time but also you thinking right this is the end this is like literally the final push this is what all those hard Wednesday 800 meter sessions every time I kill myself for about (laughs) and you just want to get it over with and I think Doha in particular was epic in the sense that they had a light show beforehand so I'd been watching all of these um, different finals that were going on and I didn't know whether the heptathletes were going to get one and then it happened and it was because uh, we we get it's like maybe like, like three heats before and ours was the final heat um, and it's the top eight I think who get to race in the final heat and yeah we had the light show where it just built the tension so much whereas like the track lines like turned into like they turned it into like the a heartbeat, heartbeat. <laughs> it was absolutely insane <laughs> And at that point, I was like, if you want to make me any more nervous, <laughs> you've done a really good job. And I think, yeah, just get it finished. That's what I was thinking. Just get it over the line and then and then you can be happy after. I rewatched the race this weekend, actually, and I'd forgotten about the light show. I did think, oh, how, you know, the nerves you must have felt just almost being on the track in that darkness as well before it started. At what point did you realise that you'd broken Jess's record when you finished? Not until it came up on the scoreboard. Um, mm. I, you know, I knew that Ed got close um, in terms of the seconds, the amount of seconds I needed. I was going to 7,000 points, but, you know, at that point it was very fine margins. And, you know, I was knackered. I had lactic up to my eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to squint at the at the scoreboard. And, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, it was it was a new PB and it was just um, over Jess's score, which is, you know, a score that has inspired me my whole career. So, you know, that's one of the first competitions I was I was in at 19 years old at the London 2012 Olympics. And, you know, I was there to, to bear witness to that British record and I knew how epic it was. So to, to surpass that was just a dream come true. And how much did your life change after that? And what was it like to deal with so much media attention as you won? 
Uh, I didn't feel like it changed that much, to be honest. I feel right. like ever since that 2012, you know, I, I've been, I had, you know, I, I was on the cusp of winning and I had that attention, but it wasn't always very positive attention. It was always attention. Um, but normally it was attention on me <laughs> failing at a stage or getting injured. So I, I don't feel like it changed that much, except people were a little bit nicer about my performance. But yeah, it was just, it, I changed in the sense that I was relieved that I finally got to show people that, you know, what I'm about and what I'm capable of. And and yeah, that, that changed me as a person for sure. And taking you back, you mentioned that there, but winning in, in such style must have laid to bed clearly so many demons that you'd, you'd had. So looking back, can you just take us back to that period between, you mentioned 2012 and being just 19, and what that experience was like then in terms of moving towards 2016? Yeah, it was it was a lot. You know, I was I was 19 years old at the time and it was my first senior international it was the home olympic games which you know not many people get the privilege to to compete in and that was you know everything to me it was my first exposure to what being an athlete is about and that's you know a couple of weeks after that you know i i left university in order to pursue my dream to to get this you know olympic medal and i dedicated the next couple of years of my life to for rio you know a lot of people put that sort of um label on me that you know you're the next person you're the the next person to do this and at 23 going into Rio Olympics everything could change you know I was very low on confidence I'd been through a number of different serious injuries um, a number of big defeats and a number of times where I you know couldn't handle the pressure almost so I think that in between those years it was I did lose the love for the the sport a little bit yeah, that, that was a very tough time for me in order to, to break through that and come out the other side of it and compete just for the love of sport um, was a very long, hard road. And we talk a lot, don't we, about the importance of, of role models, but it must have been so tough for you to be constantly compared to Jess and to Denise Lewis too, my another lovely hero of the, of the past. Uh, mm. But that, that all that talk of you being that natural successor, uh, I say, especially as you say, ahead of Rio in, in 2016, did you ever consider it wasn't for you, that, that kind of pathway? Did you consider giving up at any point? Yeah, no, that was, that was it's true what you say. You know, Jess was my role model going into to 2012. And then, you know, your role model became my biggest rival in order to try and achieve my dreams. And that's a lot to try and you know juggle at such a young age and you know I have, I've been lucky to have Denise as a you know a sounding board throughout my whole career she's been such a you know rock to me and she helped me get through that that hard phase after the Rio Olympics and yeah it was um after the Rio Olympics yeah, I just sort of I didn't want anything to do with the heptathlon again and my high jump was going quite well and you know I broke the British record in the high jump in in Rio and I just thought maybe that that's the event I started with as well and I just maybe thought that the heptathlon wasn't for me but I'm I'm so happy that I stuck stuck to my gun and stuck with it in the end and stuck where what it got do you me. think what do you think it was that that kept you going is there any advice you'd share with other athletes that might be going through kind of similar struggles from that time I was a bit stubborn in the sense that, you know, I knew I had unfinished business there. I knew that I would live with regret. And that's one of the biggest things that I, I don't want in my career. That's still something I, I sort of go into each competition with now. A sense of if I'm going to regret not trying my absolute all in this and I don't want to retire and think, oh, it could have been this, it could have been that instead of I tried and I failed. Then I think that's the mindset that I am. I just want to try everything. And if I fail, I fail. But at least I've, you know, tried my absolute best with it. And that's what I did with the heptathlon. It's like one of those things I didn't want to be at major championships and being in the high jump plane, watching the heptathlon go around. And I'm just like, oh, I wish I was involved in it. <laughs> I just didn't want that that feeling. So, you know, I just stuck to it. And in the end, I just started doing the heptathlon and the high jump and the heptathlon and the long jump and the champs too. And I love that, you know, it's lovely to hear of Denise's support at that time. But what was that catalyst that, that caused that change? Because obviously you did have a big, quite a big shift in terms of lots within your, your life and your athletics after 2016. So can you tell us yeah, about that? Yeah, it was just, you know, it was literally just like I didn't know what, what was going wrong 
I didn't know. I knew I had the talent. I knew I was capable of, of winning these medals, but I didn't know what exactly was breaking down. So I just tore up my, my whole entire life and started <laughs> again. I didn't know what was right and what was wrong. So I just thought, I'll <laughs> just get rid of all of it. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I moved to France uh, post Rio. I sold my house, I left my family and my, my two little dogs with my mom. And yeah, moved, moved here to France and haven't looked back since. Yeah, but uh, tough, tough to leave family and home and kind of all that you knew there. And I know I've heard you talk in the past in terms of your your new coach. But how has has he helped you t- transform your mental approach to the sport as well as your incredible fitness and your skill set? Clearly, how how important has that been for you? I think he's just very like a chilled out person. I think our personalities match, you know, really well. I think he's a very good. Um, person to have on your side come the championships because he's just very like just relaxed and like if something if you like do a a foul or a failure and if you get something wrong where I would normally go into panic mode he would just be like oh this was good and that was good what you need to work on is this instead of always thinking in disaster mode and I think yeah he's very um he's very good to have on your side in competition but also his training just suits my body where I do training little and often so I train the most mm. maybe eight times a week um one rest day but and it's very little and it's very often but you know it all adds up and it it made my body adapt to the heptathlon and um, more because obviously you have to keep going over two days come the competition so I think my body just I feel like I'm a heptathlete now instead of a jumper who's good at you know running and bad at throwing I feel like I'm an all-round athlete now and is that different, that level of intensity or less intensity almost from what you were doing previously in terms of your training? It's it's different in a way where, you know, you're always tired, but sometimes, <laughs> you know, you go to the track with a different focus. I used yeah. to be under the illusion that if I'm not crawling away from the track every single day and I've not killed myself and put, you know, my body through pain, then I'm not training. Whereas now I just have different focuses and we do do have sessions like that you know on on Wednesdays and sometimes on Saturdays but it's not the main focus of every Mm -hmm. session that's a good that's a positive thing (laughs) positive (laughs) message for people Uh, and how much of a blow was it for you when you discovered you know Tokyo as we all did was to be postponed in 2020 especially as you were in such incredible form coming off the back of of the world championships too yeah it was a tough blow for me to take and for all athletes as well I think that the time that it got announced, we were, you know, semi-expecting it. But, you know, when things started to unravel and we were in that sort of limbo where we were still training, but having to shelter and facilities were getting shut down and then we had to adapt. And, you know, the timeline was the same, but all the circumstances were different. That was the hardest bit, I think, about it. Um, But once it got cancelled, it was just sort of reset and, and refocus to the next like all athletes do they adapt and you know the the timeline now has changed um everyone's got an extra year some people have used that year well some people haven't you know some people are happy that you know there's been an extra year and you know maybe they're coming back from pregnancy so I just mm-hmm. think that it's just going to be a very very interesting games you know a lot of people are going to win who wouldn't have won and vice versa yeah that's really interesting isn't it to think of that <clears throat> difference in that year and of course we're now just 60 days or so away from games how are you feeling about oh. that now how, where's your head head in your body as it were yeah it's just gonna be one of those things isn't it? I, we've been waiting for it for so long now like yeah. that like it's been five years and so much has happened in the last year never mind the last four years of my life and everything I've built in the last four years has been leading into these games so I'm just yeah astounded that it's only maybe just under two months away and I think I just week by week I'm just trying to to get myself in the best shape I can and I'm just excited when it will finally be there to just see what's going to happen because I can't take the suspense anymore. (laughs) (laughs) That's so true. And you're obviously very proud, Liverpudlian. Can you tell me a little bit about kind of life growing up and and how much sport played a, a part of your life as a youngster? Yeah, sport was was everything to me. My mum, my mum wanted me to be a dancer when I was younger, and I've oh, always had like a hobby. So she always instilled the fact that I needed a hobby in my life. And I danced before I did sport for quite some time, but I think you know being 
active and outside and playing and, and doing different types of activities was always ingrained in me and I was always out on the street and never at home and yeah I did a number of different hobbies I played football I did dancing and I found athletics and you know it's my it's been my whole life so I'm glad that I've been able to make a career of something that I love. And what sort of sacrifices did your family have to make in terms of athletics? My brother actually is, um, was an international decathlete many, many okay. years ago. <laughs> but just knowing in terms of the training and the travelling to events and so on too, for your family's um, support must have been so important growing up. Yeah, I don't, I don't ever think my mum would describe it as a sacrifice. I think she absolutely loved you know, taking me to these competitions, like even to this day, she's only missed a handful of competitions. She's always been, you know, a major rock in, in my career. And once I found something that I loved, you know, she was, it was all eggs in that basket and we, you know, full steam ahead. Like we had a difficult time, you know, sometimes trying to, cause I did so many events, you know, there's so many different pairs of spikes, there's so many kicks and, yeah. you know, she didn't drive as well. So it was definitely like long rides in the National Express, to like different sorts of, <laughs> <laughs> mini competitions in Stoke and Birmingham and even Gateshead. So, yeah, it was it was very tough. But I think at the time, you know, we were just on an adventure. And we didn't think about the the journey. We were thinking about the competition. And I think the main thing she probably say is when I didn't do well, the journey back was horrendous. <laughs> I would be so <laughs> upset. I wouldn't say two words to her. <laughs> <laughs> and and how important has she been as a, a strong female role model in your life too? Yeah, she's the she's the strongest woman, you know, I know and you know, she's been such a an example to me and she's like the most caring person ever. So she's had such an important role in my upbringing. Yeah, and, and tough for her, I guess that time that when you were struggling in terms of post twenty sixteen as a mother to kind of witness that, but but great that she was there, I assume, in Doha when you when you won uh, to yeah. see the other other side of it. Yeah, I know for sure, and I always say to her, I always like sort of dedicate that performance because during those tough times, she always knew that I was capable of that. So I always say that that performance was for her to prove that she was right all along. <laughs> That was lovely. And I imagine this is kind of one of the many reasons that you're so passionate about the new Game On initiative today that's be, uh, being launched with Nike and uh, Liverpool Football Club too. It's a really ambitious project. So can you tell us a little bit more uh, about it? Yeah, it's um, it's obviously something that I'm very passionate about. You know, it's two, two <laughs> things that are close to my heart. You know, my, my Liverpool FC, my, my club and, you know, my kids sponsor Nike. They've teamed up to launch Game One, which is a programme to help local youngsters from, you know, 7 to 12 across Liverpool City region in a range of different sports from a marginalised community. So that is something that I'm very passionate about and very proud to be an ambassador of this too. And this is a partnership, obviously, as you say, it's with Nike and also with Liverpool Football Club. And you're already an ambassador for the Liverpool Football Club Foundation. So what part did the club play in, in your life growing up? Yeah, the club played like a huge part in my life. Like growing up, my granddad was a huge Liverpool fan. And just in, in my house, I used to live across the road from my nan and granddad when I was younger. And, you know, every weekend we used to just watch the football and that was a way you know, that we bonded in a way that, you know, I, I found my passion of sports and, and eventually give up dancing because of it. But yeah, Liverpool have been, you know, a huge inspiration in my career as well. You know, that never give up attitude and each season, like they just never, you know, stop inspiring um, me. So that's, you know, it's I'm absolutely over the moon to be, you know, partnering with, with the LFC Foundation for sure on this course, especially. And what do you think it is that's so unique about Liverpool and that strength of community that we, for people that aren't, you know, from the area, I guess, we just see that from the outside. But how would you describe that? I, I don't know how to describe it. I think it's it's in the anthem for a start. You'll never walk alone. It's it's part of our, you know, DNA and it's part of our beliefs. And I think that I've felt the support from not even... LFC, but Liverpool city region as a whole, you know, every time that I come back, I just feel like the whole city's rooting for me. And, you know, they have this like belief all the time in, in the underdog and I just absolutely love it. It's fabulous to hear. It's so lovely, isn't it? Um, and as you mentioned, you also support young people in your community through your own foundation. So can you tell me a little bit more about the KJT Academy and why you set that up? 
Yeah, it was similar. We set the KJT Academy up last summer. It was something that, you know, I really wanted on on reflection in the pandemic when we were just sitting around doing nothing. You know, it made us reflect <laughs> made me reflect on on my life and, you know, what I wanted to do and what I, who I wanted to be as an athlete. And, you know, we set that up with the L F C Foundation last year and that's for uh, an age group which is a little bit older than than the game on. And yeah, it's for that sort of similar similar you know black and asian community the marginalized community in that sort of dropout region where you know you don't have the financial support you don't really have the means to you know juggle schoolwork and sports because that is a privilege and i just wanted to give back and help because i had a lot of help when i was growing up and in, in that age group and you know if i didn't have that help who would have known if i would have continued with the sport so i just wanted to give back to my yeah to to my community. Excellent. We, we talk about athletics. I often think it is almost a sport that's more accessible for children from young marginalised communities and so on, perhaps, than other sports. Is that something that you've found? Is that something that you feel? Yeah, I, I believe so. I think that the, the where I can only speak for myself, but when I joined the Liverpool Harriers at a local club, it was, I think, under a pound. <laughs> I think it was under one pound to to be um to use the track and you know it's just the pair of one pair of running spikes and you can you can just do most things. You know, I used to high jump, long jump, do everything in one pair of running spikes when I first started and yeah, it's just um get them in and then you go and even at the track you could borrow some. So I think it is very open to to all sorts of people to come and just try the sport. And it is the basics, it's the foundation of, of any sport as well. So if you start in athletics, then, you know, if it's not for you, then you can go and use that, you know, speed or the strength that you trained during athletics in, in different sports too. Excellent. No, as you say, a fantastic foundation. Um, it's obviously been a really important year in terms of Black Lives Matter and the public's changing perception around racial equality. I just wonder whether it's made you reflect on your own upbringing in Liverpool and, and any racism that you experienced at the time and, and how kind of sport helped you there? Yeah, it definitely made, made me reflect on it for sure. I've spoken about it in the past and I think that you know, it is important to reflect and understand, you know, your past and your upbringing and, and how I, you know, saw myself in, in regards to, you know, some of the comments that I had or some of the um, microaggressions that I faced. And I think, yeah, sport definitely helped me have a thing, I think, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Like, athletics was my thing. I was the fast person. And, yeah, it just helped me concentrate on something that I loved, for sure. And now, fantastic that you were helping others to kind of find that that sport and outlet too. We we talk, and obviously we know that sport can be so transformational for girls and boys in terms of confidence and well-being, but especially for girls, I think they face so many body issues growing up and we're going to see more and more of that in terms of social media at the moment too. How did you deal with that as a as a young sportswoman? Was that ever an issue for you? Yeah, I think that was a big issue for me. I had a lot of anxiety about, you know, going out there and competing and, and showing my body when I was younger and I wasn't as confident. I also had a lot of anxiety about training my body and making it appear more right. masculine and muscular. When I was sort of going through puberty, that was the age of like size zero and, and that. So I think, you know, the world has changed a lot in the last 10 years. And it scares me that bodies can be trends, but I, I'm happy that it's going in the right way where a lot more people are accepting to everybody's different and everyone's got their own body shapes. And we can see that not just in the Olympics, but in athletics and in the heptathlon. Like the heptathlon is the prime example of you can win in all these different ways and it's not one body shape. You know, we're all very different in the heptathlon in terms of our strengths and weaknesses and and yeah, we've just got to acknowledge our strengths and weaknesses and use them and use them to our advantage. You know, I hate to be in the tall, muscular, you know, teenager growing up, but now it's really, it's really paying off for me in my sport. Absolutely. I often think it's tough as a female athlete, as a track athlete or track and field, because you're literally so on display in your, your kit, not skimpy kit, but, you know, in terms of your, your body being up there on, on display. So do you think that will change in the future or do you think that will always be the case and we'll just accept bodies as they are more moving forward? No, I think the world's changing at a very rapid pace. And I think the younger generation is growing up in a world where we're talking about a lot more stuff openly and with 
being body positive and body shaming is less of a thing. So I, I think that that's hopefully going to change. <laughs> Really positive. Yeah, hopefully we, we are seeing changes there. So I guess looking to the future now, as we discussed, Tokyo is not far away. I just wonder, looking ahead, if you did win Olympic gold, do you think um, you would keep competing after Tokyo? What are your, yeah. your thoughts there? Yeah, I think so, for sure. You know, I've got a lot more years left in me. I still don't feel like I've reached my full potential and I haven't won, you know, everything there is to win yet. Like I said before, I've still got a lot of unfinished business. <laughs> And in terms of life after competitive sport, clearly you've set up the amazing academy and the kind of work you're doing with campaigns like Game On. But what would you hope for? Have you got thoughts for life after competitive sport in the future? I think um, I'm just going to get like a house with a big back garden and then get a load of dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I love that. What dogs do you have? You've got two dogs, I have you said. two little sausage dogs, but I'm currently obsessed with, with the Hungarian Vizsla. Oh, I've uh, researched it a lot. Them. and Yeah, I just think I've researched it a lot and they need like two hours walks every day. So I'm not ready yet. I'm still in an apartment in Liverpool. I live in the city. So yeah, I think I'll buy a house for a dog. <laughs> <laughs> They're definitely on my, my wish list too. And, and just looking back now, if you were giving advice to yourself, so that young, I guess, a 19-year-old coming into London, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't realise that you were still a student then at that time too. But but looking back, what advice would you give to, to young female athletes or sportswomen, any sports coming into to sport? Uh, I think the advice that I would, would give any female athlete or the advice that I give myself is that, you know, everyone's journey is different and don't compare. Comparison is, is really never productive, productive thing. So, you know, just focus on yourself and don't put, put too much pressure on yourself as well. Just everyone's journey is different. Thanks again to Katerina for taking the time out of her hectic schedule to talk to me. I can't wait to see her back in action in Tokyo later this month. It was lovely to hear her talk about the impact of Jessica Ennis Hill and Denise Lewis, and I'm incredibly lucky to have spoken to both of them for the Game Changers. You can hear their fascinating stories and all of my previous guests at fearlesswomen.co.uk and that's also where you can see more of the other work I do, including the Women's Sport Collective, a network for all women working in sport, and you can also sign up to Changing the Game, our free weekly newsletter that highlights the latest developments in women's sport. Thanks again to Barclays for their kind support of the Game Changers. To Sam Walker, our executive producer, Rory Alskri on sound production and to Kate Hannon, behind the scenes making sure everything runs smoothly. Do come and say hello on social media where you'll find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at The Game Changers or at Sue Anstis. The Game Changers. Fearless women in sport. <laughs>